We've had a lot of history in the past of volatility before midterm. Sometimes we have it, sometimes we don't. But one of the points that I always make is that we're in a unique time that's consistent with history as opposed to inconsistent with history in that if you look at the midterm election quarter, it's been positive 87% of the history of the S&P 500. If you look at the subsequent first quarter of the next year, it's been positive also 87% of history. And the second quarter of the next year has been positive 87% of history, which I've sometimes referred to as the 87% miracle. But if you take those three quarters together, when one of the quarters has been negative, as this one might be because of the weakness in October, it's still been true that the nine months overall has been positive 91% of history, and that's been regardless of whether we had gridlock or not. It's really about falling uncertainty, because going into a period like now, we ask, what about this, and what about that, and if the Democrats this, and if the Republicans that. But the outcome right. of a midterm election is falling uncertainty. Markets like that. We've had a big global correction where America's done better than the rest of the world. Sentiment is dour outside of America, which is good. And yep. things are actually pretty darn positive. So, so in other words, uh, the event happens. Uh, uh, one less, one fewer uncertainties for the market to juggle, and then we can move on to focusing on things like what? Trade and, and overall global growth? And of course, there's the endless nonsense. I mean, t today is the beginning of the presidential campaign, which is kind of unfortunate in a lot of ways. We kind of have sunset, sunrise, midterm elections, presidential election. It's kind of a sorry state in terms of the continuity of the political turmoil, but the fact of the matter is, Leading indicators are high and rising over most of the world, with a few exceptions like Britain and Japan, where they have their own individual problems, the one associated with Brexit and the other uh, yeah. more or less continuous stupid policies. And then you've got the fact is people worry about all kinds of stuff. This year there's been an inordinate amount of talk about flattening yield curve in America, but in fact if you were to go to the Treasury's website, you can do a very nice historical depiction of the yield curve now versus the yield curve at other points in time. And today's yield so curve is as steep or steeper than any single year in the back half of the 1990s, which was a roaring period. So, Ken, wh where does that leave us when we get further into next year when indeed the 2020 uh, presidential uh, gear up is in full swing? And, and I guess we've got to start worrying about the things that are inevitable for the market to worry about trade entitlements after kind of first term promises uh, w what happens with actually delivering on, on what the economy needs well my point's been that the tariff fears have been overblown and i've written a lot about that the actual tariffs are a tax and the total tax of all of the things proposed by any country anywhere in 2018 amount to approximately 4% of one year's global GDP growth. So it's really been making mountains out of what's a relative molehill. But the fact is what I think we do is we get past this corrective period that we've been in with two minor dips in the U.S. market and a bigger dip overseas, and we move forward into the uh, continuation of the bull market that's far from a nebulous stage and far from having anything that we can see that would kill it. So have you made any investment picks here, Ken, based on a prediction for the outcome of these elections? I mean, if the Democrats win, are you expecting the Fed to pull back away from these rate hikes somewhat because of slower growth? Or are you positioning yourself uh, in a different way if the Republicans manage to maintain their majorities in both houses? I've never had much confidence in uh, central banks to engage in very intelligent monetary policy at all because I've always been a big fan of Milton Friedman's teachings. But the fact of the matter is, I don't think they'll be very different whether the Democrats take the House or don't take the House. What I think will happen is we'll see a continuation of the trend that we've had throughout the back half of this bull market of leadership from big, high-quality, growthy companies, tech on the one hand, and big tech in particular, uh, big pharma, uh, and to a lesser extent, uh, consumer discretionary and consumer staples. But those two big engines, healthcare 
and technology, I think, continue to move forward as we get past this corrective period.